Okay, welcome everyone uh, to this new seminar uh, uh, organized by the Center uh, of Astrobiology. So today uh, we have Mauro Stefanon, I don't know whether I pronounced that correctly. That's okay. fine. Yeah. <laughs> so from the University of Leiden. So to introduce Mauro, uh, so he he started um, being related to astrophysics, no, to the, this uh, world of astrophysics by serving for three years as a support astronomer at the Isola Silla Observatory. Uh, then after then he enrolled, he started his PhD um, at the University of Valencia in in Spain, and then he he obtained uh, the PhD in 2011. Then he moved um, to the University of uh, Missouri, where he did a, a postdoctoral uh, contract for two years, um, working with Professor Hao Jin Yang. And then in 2014, he moved to Leiden, where he he's working. Uh, he has been working with a Dr. Ivo Labi uh, first, and then with a Professor Richard Bowens. So, Mauro, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And uh, whenever you're ready. Yeah. Well, th thanks a lot to you for for this invitation. I'm I'm really happy to to be able to. For, for, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. And uh, before actually starting, I would just like to acknowledge, to, to thank also my collaborators that you see below here. So Ivo, Richard, and Pascal, uh, mostly. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, thanks to the uh, significant improvements in uh, uh, instrumentation, especially thanks to the uh, improvement with uh, with HST uh, in the last decade or so, we have been able to uh, uncover uh, quite large samples of galaxies observing the early universe. It's, uh, there are about uh, uh, fifteen thousand galaxies observed uh, when the universe was about uh, uh, one and a half giga year old and and earlier. So here you can see a, a very quick, a very summarized history of the universe. Um, uh, the, the current time is here on the left, and the frontier of uh, observation of galaxies is about here uh, uh, between, let's say, uh, uh, shift 10 and, and 12. So uh, I know that um, probably among the uh, uh, people who are listening right now, there are people, there are those who don't, for, for which redshift doesn't mean uh, very much. I've tried to uh, convert every time in, in, in the talk, every time I talk about redshift to just give you an, a, a sense of, uh, the, of the age of the universe that redshift refers to. Hmm? So redshift 11 is about 400 million years after the, the Big Bang. And this is about the, uh, the, 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 the frontier right now. So in my, the first part of the talk, I will uh, present very briefly some uh, observational results uh, of galaxy formation and evolution uh, uh, from uh, which relate to galaxies uh, in the last, let's say, 10, 12 uh, uh, billion years. Uh, but then uh, the, the central uh, part of, the, uh, of, the, of this talk will, will, will deal about galaxies uh, uh, observed when the universe was at most one billion years, uh, one billion year old. Actually, between uh, zero point four uh, and and one uh, billion year of age. But I would first like to start with a, a slightly uh, different introduction. So, uh, thanks to the uh, synergy between observation from from ground uh, based telescope over. Uh, very large areas of sky and uh, uh, satellite uh, observation like uh, those from Planck and WMAP, we have been able to uh, start answering one fundamental question, which is what is the composition of the universe? Hmm? And it turns out that uh, uh, for approximately 95% of this uh, content, we don't have a clear explanation. We don't, we don't fully understand. Hmm? And 70% uh, of this is what we call dark energy, uh, it's, uh, 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 which is responsible for the accelerated expansion of the universe. And uh, for the exp accelerated expansion of the universe and for the uh, uh, cosmological framework in which we uh, place our galaxies. 
and this is uh, we are lucky that uh, we can uh, uh, we, we can separate uh, the cosmology from the uh, astrophysical from the astrophysical processes that govern galaxy formation and evolution. So even if we don't fully understand what dark energy is, we still can try to uh, understand how galaxies formed and evolved. And uh, going back to the to the composition of the universe. Uh, approximately 25-ish percent of the of the uh, uh, of the content of the universe is in form of a matter that we again we don't understand we call it dark matter uh, we we postulated the, its, its existence based on uh, the uh, graphi uh, on the gravitational effects that we see that it makes on uh, galaxies but we have not yet been able to uh, construct detectors that actually register the dark matter. And then there is a 5% of ordinary baryonic matter. And a, little, a bit more into detail into this 5% tells us that most of it is gas. And by gas, uh, in, in astrophysics, we, uh, when we talk about gas, it's mostly hydrogen. And gas, not in galaxies, but gas in in between galaxies, so intergalactic gas, either hot, cold, we, we are not interested right now. Then there is some gas, uh, like 10% uh, of gas, which resides in galaxies. And this is uh, fundamental because it is the gas that it is used to create uh, new stars, to form new stars. And stars make up only 7% of, uh, of the baryonic matter. So it's a very, very small fraction. In the total budget of the energy energy budget of the universe stars make up only uh, uh, 0 0.3, approximately 0 0.3, 0 0.4% of, 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 of all the budget. Uh, so um, because dark matter uh, uh, um, constitutes a, a a, a, a significant fraction of all the matter in the universe. If we want to understand how galaxies formed and evolved, we also have to understand how dark matter works. And as I was quickly saying before, so we know that dark matter follows one physical law, which is gravity. And this is, is very helpful because in this way we can, uh, uh, it is easier for us to understand how, to, how, how it works. We cannot solve the, 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 uh, the equations uh, analytically because it is too complex, but we can use supercomputer to simulate it. And here I'm going to show you a very uh, short movie, uh, which presents you the evolution of the, uh, of, of the dark matter from when the universe was extremely young, uh, about uh, 200 mega years. So when we think the first stars started to appear to the present day. And you can see here that there are these white spots here. These are over density in the distribution of dark matters. So these are uh, regions with uh, uh, a, um, a deeper gravitational potential. And in these regions, it is, uh, it is with, it, it was, sorry, these regions which uh, uh, accreted uh, dark matter from the surrounding and uh, formed uh, large, more massive and more massive halos as time goes by. Uh, but because uh, the, of the prevalence of dark matter, so because uh, dark matter, or because of the gravitational potential of dark matter uh, um, in, in the total uh, 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 gravitational potential of, of matter in the universe, the dark matter also uh, drives the accretion of baryonic matter, so of gas. And so what happens, what we think it happens, is that uh, the gas, uh, the hydrogen, which is in between galaxies, uh, following the dark matter, is also accreting onto these uh, regions here, uh, onto these uh, over densities. And this is where then it is converted into stars and when, and when we see then galaxies that, that form. Uh, it has been a, a problem, actually, uh, that uh, at the beginning, um, uh, for models, models were actually generating a lot of stars, uh, many more stars in galaxies than we were uh, uh, actually measuring, yeah? both at, for very massive galaxies and also for uh, 
uh, low mass galaxies. And so what is the uh, commonly accepted uh, um, uh, scenario right now is that there are physical processes which uh, decrease the efficiency with which the gas is converted into stars. So decrease the star formation efficiency. And there are different uh, mechanisms for, for massive galaxies and for low mass galaxies. Here uh, we see a common way of expressing the integrated star formation efficiency. And this is uh, usually the, regarded as the ratio between the uh, total amount of stars in a galaxy, so the stellar mass, uh, to the uh, amount of dark matter in, in the galaxy, so the uh, uh, dark matter halo mass. And this is done for uh, uh, different galaxies, which span a, a range of, uh, of masses. The good news is that uh, it seems like that, uh, at least in our local universe, this, is, this curve here is, is for our local universe, uh, uh, seem only to depend seems only to depend on 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 the uh, halo mass mm? and as we can see here uh, uh, um, the efficiency so this ratio uh, is not uh, independent on the halo mass but there are uh, there is a peak in in efficiency uh, which corresponds to approximately 10 to the 12 solar masses and then both at the high mass end and at the low mass end, there are uh, the efficiency decreases. So the stellar mass for a given halo mass is lower. And uh, we, know, we, we have our uh, common idea right now is that uh, for very massive galaxies, the supermassive black holes that are uh, in the center of these galaxies are hitting the gas and prevent star formation. And uh, something similar also happens uh, uh, thanks to uh, from the star formation uh, at the low mass end of galaxies. So the video, the movie that I show you before sh already showed that the uh, the distribution of the ma of the dark matter ma uh, of the dark matter did not uh, remain constant with time, but it evolved. Eh? So we can ask ourselves if this curve is uh, independent of time or not. Uh, one reason why it should it could not be uh, uh, universal, so, sorry, we could not be uh, constant, but depend on time, is that, for instance, the accretion rate of the dark matter halo also evolves. So, for instance, in the last 1.5 giga years, uh, the accretion rate has decreased by a factor about uh, 40 or so. But also uh, the uh, the uh, physical mechanism, so the, the energy output from uh, those physical mechanisms that we think are responsible for the decrease in uh, efficiency of star, of, of star formation have evolved with cosmic time. For instance, the uh, energy output from the supermassive black holes has evolved. But also we know from uh, studies in the very early universe, so for instance here it's, uh, I'm referring to about uh, one, uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 giga years of cosmic time, we know that there were, or at least we have a, a clue that uh, there was a very intense radiation field so the, the, uh, generated by uh, star formation, by very hot stars. And this may have heaten the, uh, uh, the, the hydrogen preventing again the, uh, the, the formation of galaxies, the, of stars, sorry. But not only dark matter, uh, dark matter halo merge, also galaxies. And uh, we have seen, we, we see uh, recent studies have shown it uh, uh, very, very, very neatly that the merger rate of galaxies has evolved with, with time, with cosmic time. As you can see here, there is a decrease, in, a, a decrease with time that you can see in the uh, upper uh, uh, axis. There is a clear decrease in time of the merger rate of galaxies. And finally, uh, we uh, there is also we we, we observed in an evolution of the amount of gas which is available for 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 the, for the star formation. So traditionally, we were inferring the amount of gas from the stars which were formed. Eh? But now, thanks to 
uh, ALMA, for instance, we can directly observe, we can directly measure the amount of gas which is uh, in galaxies at very uh, uh, early time. So for instance, here you can see the evolution uh, from approximately uh, uh, the, from when the universe was about 1.5 billion years old until today. Hmm? And it's actually quite remarkable that is it, it, uh, it, uh, the, the, the evolution of the, uh, of the gas uh, resembles that of the star formation. So the question is, does the star formation, when we put everything uh, together, all this uh, observation, uh, uh, do we have, do we recover a star formation efficiency that evolve or not with time? The answer is that it is still uncertain. So there are uh, uh, discordant uh, results, both between uh, observation, like I'm showing you in this case, and also using different techniques uh, in the previous, in this case, I'm showing you abundance matching, so, so uh, counting uh, galaxies, and here clustering, so from the large scale structure of the universe, but also how different models, models how different models, uh, uh, take into account all the evolution that I've shown you in the previous slide. So some models say that, uh, uh, some model predict that there is no evolution or interpret the observation as there is no evolution. Some other models say that uh, there is evolution. Um, because the uh, star formation efficiency, so as you, as you may remember, so star formation efficiency is uh, the result of two terms. One is the stellar mass, so the amount of stars in a galaxy, and the other one is the amount of dark matter in the galaxy. For the dark matter, we can say, we can reasonably have a, an idea of how it works. So we can sort of measure the amount of, uh, of dark matter in galaxies. And, but for, for the stellar mass, this is especially at uh, early cosmic times, it, it is quite uh, challenging. Uh, it is a quite challenging things to measure. Uh, here I'm uh, uh, showing a few ways of measuring stellar masses or at least to infer the evolution of the assembly of stars uh, with, with, with uh, cosmic time. And uh, the three here in the, the red boxes are the three that I'm going to touch a little bit more in, in detail in what comes. And in, in particular, these are uh, the uh, evolution of the star formation rate. So of the, uh, uh, how fast galaxies produce new stars with, star with time. Of the specific star formation rate, which is uh, um, uh, the, uh, it is related to the age. I'll, I'll come back to this later. And then we also have, we can also uh, 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 measure uh, sort of directly the uh, increase in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in stellar mass uh, in galaxies. Mm -hmm. So I start from, from the uh, evolution of the accretion rate um, uh, in, in, in this plot. Uh, I'm showing as a function of, of time the evolution of the uh, accretion rate of the dark matter halos. Mm? So how fast or how much new matter, new dark matter is accrete on, uh, on the dark matter halos. And this is a sort of equivalent of the formation of new stars, if we, if we, if we think. Uh, it's been quite uh, challenging to uh, measure the, uh, uh, the uh, star formation, the evolution of the star formation rates, especially in the first, uh, in, at the uh, uh, earliest, uh, earliest epochs. Hmm? And actually, uh, while there was sort of uh, a concordance between the evolution of the uh, total star formation rates, it's star formation rate density, actually. So it's the, uh, uh, it's the cumulative amount of star formation in a, a unit of volume uh, of, of the universe. So uh, while there was uh, um, quite a concordance between the ev evolution of the star formation rate density uh, in the last, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 12 billion years, 12, 13 billion years, 
the measurements at the very, very early times uh, uh, where, so there was a lot of discussion in the literature between measurements at the early times, but that actually, thanks to the most recent observations, we have been able to, uh, uh, to constrain quite accurately the star formation rate at, uh, uh, at this very early time. So it's about uh, four, 500 million years. And this show very nicely that the evolution, when we consider all, when we combine all the observations, the evolution of the star formation rate is uh, uh, consistent with the uh, evolution of the dark matter halo. So uh, the, there is no fit of the um, uh, orange uh, regions to the points that you see. It's just a superposition and it works very nicely. Hmm? So this suggests us that uh, galaxies are forming stars at the same way, the same rate that halo, dark matter halo are accreting dark matter. Hmm? So this is one, uh, one probe, let's say, of uh, star formation efficiency. A second probe uh, comes from the evolution of the specific star formation rate. So as you can see here at the top, the specific star formation rate is defined as the ratio between the star formation rate, so how many uh, new stars are formed, to the stellar mass, so the total content in stars in a galaxy. Mm. And it turns out that the dimension of this, uh, um, uh, of this quantity is the inverse of time. And we can think, uh, we can have a, 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 um, an idea of what this means by uh, uh, um, considering that the case, the simplest case of star formation, which is a galaxy, which is forming stars at a constant rate. In this case, the specific star formation rate is equivalent to the inverse of the time that is required from the onset of star formation uh, to the epoch that at which we are, are observing the galaxy. So it's, which is usually called the age of the galaxy. Hmm? So it's the total time that was required to completely form the galaxy as we observe it. Hmm. And uh, uh, and so it's it's uh, uh, in, uh, let's say from an in, 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 from an intuitive point of view, we can say that uh, a, uh, a high value of specific specific star formation rate means a, a very uh, young age, while a low value of specific star formation rate means an old age of the stellar population. The interesting thing is that uh, people have shown that uh, uh, have shown analytically that the evolution of the uh, specific accretion rate of dark matter halos, so it's the equivalent of the specific star formation rate, but for dark matter halos, uh, evolves as a power of uh, five over two of the redshift. Mm? So one could think of comparing this. Uh, uh, um, prediction to what to observation. And actually this prediction has also been confirmed by more, uh, how can I say, uh, elaborated models hmm, of galaxy formation. So let's say uh, maybe models will just give slightly different result. Maybe there is a slight dependence on, on the mass, uh, which is still unclear or not, but the overall trend of the evolution of the specific star formation rate and of the specific accretion rate of dark matter halos should be this one. It, it's predicted to be this one. So how can we measure uh, the specific star formation rate? So measuring star formation rate for uh, early galaxies is relatively easy. It's a consolidated, sort of consolidated uh, um, uh, procedure. The measurements of stellar mass is also sort of consolidated, but it is more challenging because uh, 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 we need access to uh, uh, very deep uh, data. So here I'm trying to uh, 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 summarize how we measure stellar masses in, uh, in, in, distant, gal in distant galaxies. So while for local galaxies, we, we could, uh, we can actually, um, uh, resolve the stellar content so we can see the individual stars for high redshift galaxies. So for very distant galaxies, the light that we uh, 
uh, that our detectors uh, uh, register is sort of uh, blurred because it's uh, it's a uh, we don't have enough ref resolution. And so the light that we receive is the sort of average of light over uh, over either the full source or a large area of the source. Uh, and so um, in order to um, estimate uh, the uh, stellar content, we have to um, uh, use make use of uh, models and uh, uh, we know uh, that the uh, the uh, stars which make up most of the mass in galaxies are the uh, stars with the uh, smaller the, with the lowest lowest uh, mass. So the smallest stars constitute most of the mass in stars in galaxies, uh, and the uh, um, the spectrum of these stars uh, has a peak of emission uh, in, the, um, uh, in the optical window. Mm? So it is very important if we want to have a, an, 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 an as accurate as possible estimate of the mass of galaxies, of the stellar mass of galaxies, sorry. It is very important to have very uh, uh, significant measurement of the optical light of galaxies. But then, because of, of, of the expansion of the universe, the optical light that is emit, as, as it is emitted by the galaxies is received by us at redder, wave, uh, at red, at redder wavelengths, which is the, re, the, uh, the redshift. And so what is optical for a galaxy, it is for us the near infrared or even, even worse, or, or even redder, I mean. And so, so far, uh, um, uh, the, if we wanted to study uh, the stellar mass of galaxies in the first sort of billion years of, uh, uh, of, of life of the universe, uh, we didn't have very uh, exceptionally deep uh, uh, imaging or exceptionally deep information on this rest frame optical um, uh, light. But actually, uh, it is uh, from 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 our group. Uh, our group actually, it was a program uh, led by uh, Ivo Labbe. We have um, uh, assembled. A, we have obtained a lot of data, a lot of observation uh, from the Spitzer uh, uh, telescope. Spitzer is a very small telescope. It's a, uh, it's uh, the diameter of the main mirror. I think it's uh, eighty centimeters. So it's like a. a uh, higher end amateur telescope, but it is put in space and it is in, and it observes at the wavelength uh, at near infrared wavelength, which corresponds to the rest frame optical of our galaxy of our high redshift galaxies. So we have obtained quite a, a significant amount of new data over uh, two fields, which are uh, the two fields which are um, which contain already uh, very deep um, uh, data from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, this actually is one of the this, the these two fields now, thanks to this uh, to, to to the great um, uh, program, now contains uh, contain the the deepest data, deepest near infrared data uh, available so far before JWST. And so, thanks to this very deep data. Uh, ah, sorry. Yes. So, just to give you an idea of uh, uh, of uh, how significant the increase, the improvement in depth, so in quality of the of our data is. So, this is a region of um, um, uh, of the of one of the two fields that I was telling you, which is called Goods with Goods uh, South, I think. Uh, this is the data that we had previously before the new grades data, and this is what we have now. So uh, it's not just a change in uh, in the cuts of the image, but you can fix uh, yourself, for instance, here, and you can see that uh, there will be uh, additional objects that are not present in the uh, original, uh, in the older version of the data, right? So this gives us a, 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 an idea of of, of the uh, uh, of the wealth of information that you are going to recover from this data. Um, I 
I would like now to make a couple of uh, digression. It's uh, it's two technical points, but uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we, uh, they become useful at, uh, 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 along the uh, the talk. So. Uh, um, the, uh, the 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 filters so the bands in which uh, uh, I, uh, Spitzer observed uh, this um, uh, provided us with this uh, very deep uh, imaging are centered at 3.6 and 4.5 micron. Eh? So these are the two main uh, bands uh, of observation from Spitzer, and when we plot. Uh, uh, the uh, color between these two bands as a function of uh, redshift, we can see that there is, uh, so the, the, for, for all galaxies uh, for which we can measure the, the, this data, we can see that there is uh, the, the, the behavior of, the, of this color uh, is not uh, very regular, but uh, there are up and downs, right? Uh, which depends on, seem to, de seem to depend on redshift. Uh, there, at the beginning, this was not very well understood, and uh, uh, it took a little bit, uh, uh, and also uh, uh, introduced some uh, um, systematic error in in some um, uh, in the conclusion, some measurements of previous paper. But now, since uh, like uh, ten years, we think we understand what's happening, and in order to uh, hopefully better illustrate you uh, what's the reason of this. Uh, here on, on the bottom part of the, uh, of the slide, uh, I'll go, I'm going to show you a very quick movie again. So the black line here, black curve, uh, represent the spectrum. It's a synthetic spectrum of a galaxy, uh, which uh, uh, as you can see here, it is placed at redshift three. So this is about uh, 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 when the universe was about uh, 2 billion years old. Hmm? The red area here and the, uh, sorry, red and, and blue area here correspond to the two filters from, uh, from Spitzer. Hmm? And the uh, blue and red point here correspond to the flux that we would measure from this galaxy here in these two filters. Hmm? So you are going to see that this point here will move up and down uh, uh, as the redshift increase. And this is what we think uh, is because uh, uh, the emission lines that you can, you can see here, so emission lines in very uh, distant galaxies are very strong. And this can affect the, uh, uh, or can uh, introduce a, and uh, uh, extra flux in the in, in the measurements, hmm? and the and so this weird uh, behavior of the of this color is caused simply by uh, uh, different emission lines which enter and leave each one or in turn the uh, 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 these two bands as depending on the redshift. Uh, let me see. Okay, so as you can see here, the blue goes up. Now it's very high and then goes down and you can see here that the color changes in correspondence of the lines entering and, and leaving the, 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 the bands. Okay, so the second small technical thing. So um, also this is quite, um, um, it is well established now that one way of uh, measuring the age of galaxies is through a feature which is called the, the Balmer break, which is highlighted here. So here you can see in black, the curves of, um, um, of uh, simulated galaxies. Mm. So these are synthetic spectra of galaxies, which go from the UV to the infrared. Mm. So the visible is, 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 like, is, is here. So what, what we would see with our eyes is, is, is this range here. And as you can see, there is around this wavelength here, in this uh, um, uh, window of, of wavelengths, uh, there is this feature here, which is rising, hmm, depending on the age of the of the of the galaxy. So very young ages uh, are. Sorry, I should have said this before that uh, 
uh, each model is labeled with the age of the population. So, in, and uh, this number here expresses the age of the population of the stellar population in uh, billion years. So this is very young. It is like uh, uh, one million year, ten million year, one hundred million year, four hundred, one billion year, four and thirteen billion year. So as we can see that as the stellar population of the galaxies becomes older and older, this feature here uh, uh, increases. So it means that if we look at the color, so if we take a picture in two, band, in two filters, one located here and one located here, it means that, so here on the left you have blue color and on the right you have, let's say, redder color. Hmm? It means that the color of the galaxy uh, changes from blue to red as it becomes older and older. Hmm? And so we can use the measurement of this color to infer or try to reconstruct the age of the of, of, of the galaxy or the stellar population of the galaxy. And through the age, then we can also uh, um, better constrain the, the mass. And so uh, here I'm showing you uh, what was the situation, what was the uh, uh, our sort of best knowledge of the uh, spectra of galaxies uh, at very early time. So this is redshift eight, which corresponds to about 650 million years of co cosmic time. Uh, this refers to uh, re quite um, bright galaxies. And the measurements here are the red points and this um, uh, upper arrows, um, uh, upper limits here. While the, the blue curve here corresponds to our interpretation of the of the data. So this is a model eh, that we fit to the to the data. And this is before this is the situation that we had. Uh, so this is what we could uh, measure before uh, adding that large amount of data from from grades. But now thanks to the increased much increased depth of uh, of uh, observation in the near infrared which corresponds to the rest frame optical we have been able to ex expand uh, uh, our view on the shape of the spectrum. It is a very uh, low resolution spectrum, right? It's five point, four points or, or so of galaxies at these ages. Yeah? And uh, uh, we can uh, notice two main, uh, um, two main properties of these galaxies. One is that they have this very red color. So there is this, this pronounced difference between uh, uh, the in the flux densities of this in these two bands. These are the two IRAC bands, uh, and so this tells us that when we say this, we say that it has a very red color because the uh, uh, flux density at redder wavelength is uh, uh, higher than the flux density in the blue wavelength. And the second uh, uh, and the second uh, main feature is a blue or neutral between neutral and blue color between the uh, between this point here, which is rest frame ultraviolet, and this point here, which is uh, just redder than the Balmer break that I showed you before. And so this first uh, feature here that I was saying, you to, so the red uh, IRAC color corresponds to uh, the uh, extreme emission line. So we are talking for, for those uh, who have a, 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 a sense of, 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 of the numbers, uh, we are talking about uh, equivalent width of about 1000 angstrom for the combination of uh, H beta and O3, or, or, and the two O3 lines. Hmm? So this is uh, huge. It's uh, among the highest or the most intense uh, emission lines in normal star forming galaxies. The second feature is this blue color. And as you remember, uh, uh, just before we were saying that the ages, as, as, as the age of the stellar population goes from uh, uh, young to old, the color of the Balmer break from the Balmer break goes from blue to red. And in case, in this case, we have a blue color or neutral. So this is also, this is also telling us that uh, the age of these galaxies is very young, must be very young. This is also uh, 
consistent with uh, this very strong emission line. So very strong emission lines usually happen when the stellar population uh, is, is, uh, uh, is very young. So there are uh, blue stars which, are, which emit a lot of ionizing radiation and uh, this ionizing radiation uh, uh, ionizes the gas and generates uh, strong emission lines. So these are suggesting us that there are very, st uh, very young uh, uh, stellar population. And if we convert the age into specific star formation rate, we sh should expect very high specific star formation rate. So, but how, how high? So when we uh, combine our observation with uh, those in the, in the literature, we can see that uh, 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 there is a, a smooth evolution in the specific star formation rate. And this smooth evolution is consistent with uh, the evolution of the specific uh, uh, accretion rate of the dark matter halos. Mm -hmm. So this also suggests us that the star formation efficiency uh, uh, should have not strongly evolved, at least in this uh, uh, in this period here, which goes from like, uh, let's say uh, 600 million years to about uh, one, 1.5 uh, billion years of cosmic time. Okay, so we are now ready for the third uh, um, uh, probe of, um, uh, uh, of assembly of, of mass, of stellar mass. And this is sort of more direct uh, measurements. Hmm? So we can measure for, in, for uh, given a sample of galaxies at a given age, okay, sorry, at a given uh, time in the, in the history of the universe, we can measure uh, the stellar mass for each individual galaxy, and then sort of construct a, a histogram of the distribution of these galaxies as a function of the stellar mass. So this is what we have recently done. We have used uh, uh, all the, the uh, the uh, deepest and also highest resolution data available for this, which comes from the five candles fields. So we combined all samples of galaxies, of star forming galaxies actually, uh, um, uh, which were previously identified over five, the five candles, uh, the five candle fields at redshift between six and 10. So redshift six corresponds to one billion years and redshift 10 is about uh, 450 uh, uh, million years of age of the universe. And these are the, uh, what I was saying, that the sort of histograms of the distribution of the stellar masses for the galaxies as a function of the stellar mass for the five different uh, uh, redshifts, so for five uh, different uh, um, uh, cosmic times for, for five, for five dif different cosmic ages. And so thanks to this, the, the increased depth from the great uh, observation, we can confidently, confidently measure the stellar masses down to very relatively low uh, values in stellar mass. So it's about 10 to the eight solar masses across the, almost the full range of redshift that we, that, that we have considered. And so the first question is, uh, does the uh, total amount of, uh, of uh, stars in galaxies, uh, how does the total amount of stars in galaxy compare to the total amount of dark matter in galaxies? So we can uh, uh, recover this uh, or try to answer this question by uh, comparing the uh, 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 our um, uh, distribution of stellar masses to that of the to the equivalent distribution of masses of the dark matter halos, and here you can have a first answer to this question. So the red points here correspond to the total mass in stars in these galaxies, as, as we recover from the from the from the measurements that I show you before, and the uh, orange uh, region here instead corresponds to the uh, total amount in, uh, uh, in dark matter mass, in the mass of dark matter, in the halos of those galaxies. And 
the, the, uh, this quantity has been uh, arbit sort of arbitrarily uh, um, uh, divided by a factor 100 because the dark matter the dark matter is much more abundant than than, uh, than, than stars. Mm? But the uh, surprising, at least for me, uh, 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 result was that uh, the evolution of the uh, uh, um, uh, dark matter uh, density uh, very much resembles the evolution of the stellar mass density. At, at, oops, sorry. At least across uh, the, 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 the Rashi frame that we have considered. But the, this measurement here that uh, I'm showing you uh, uh, are dominated by the abundance of galaxies uh, with very low stellar masses. So we can also ask ourselves if there is any dependence of, uh, of this result on the stellar mass on, of, of the galaxies, which is actually uh, the star formation efficiency. And this is what I'm showing you here. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, uh, ratio between the stellar mass and the halo mass that we recover by comparing the uh, stellar mass function that I showed you before to the halo mass function. And the uh, it's a very surprising uh, result, uh, which uh, as you can see here, uh, the very surprising re result is that there doesn't seem to be any significant evolution in, in this ratio with across the entire redshift range that we have considered. So, um, as you may have heard at this point, uh, in, in, um, uh, in the fall of this year, hopefully JWST, uh, a new, uh, 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 a much better telescope, the successor of HST is going to be launched. And uh, it's quite, it's, it's, the main mirror is about uh, 6.5 meters uh, of diameter. So uh, we hope to be able to go much deeper. Uh, and uh, have much better measurements of stellar mass and all other physical uh, uh, par uh, properties of these galaxies. And uh, uh, um, actually, uh, there are going to be uh, a number of programs uh, 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 very useful for this kind of uh, studies. And uh, 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 thankfully, uh, this program, most of this program uh, are going to be uh, public. So the data for this program are going, is going to be uh, public Im immediately. And this is going to be uh, very useful. But here I just wanted to also to show you, it's not another point, which is another improvement that, uh, that we are going to have from uh, JWST, uh, which is not only going deep, deeper, but also we are going to have much better spatial resolution. Eh? As you can see, this is a comparison between simulation in, in both cases, eh? I think, uh, between the current resolution that we have at rest frame optical from Spitzer, IRAC, and what we think we are going to have with, uh, with, with, with JWST. I think it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a huge uh, improvement in our uh, in our ability to also analyze or to recover the physical parameters of this uh, of this galaxy. And if I have uh, like a few minutes left, if I can still talk for, for, for a few minutes, uh, I would like to uh, introduce one last uh, topic very quickly. So um, the measurements of the stellar to halo mass that I'm showing you here only probe uh, intermediate to low mass. Uh, so we don't know very, very well what's going on here at the, for, the very, for the most massive galaxies, here and here. Uh, but in the last few years, there has been uh, uh, indication of, of the existence of very massive galaxies at very early times in the, uh, uh, soon after the, so few, Million, few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And so the natural question is uh, whether the star formation efficiency, at least in these systems, uh, could have been higher than uh, for normal system. Uh, it's not only that we observe very massive galaxies at early times, but this galaxy, some of these galaxies also seem to have 
evolved stellar population. So here I'm showing you uh, in another way, the, the Balmer break that we discussed before. This is for a very uh, high redshift galaxies. This is redshift 9.1, which corresponds to about, uh, uh, I think uh, about uh, 500, uh, yeah, about 500 million years uh, after the Big Bang. And this is quite unexpected because we would have uh, expected only uh, still uh, uh, galaxies which are just forming stars and are, are, are relatively new. The, the time since the Big Bang has been short, so uh, why should we have uh, uh, galaxies which have not generated new stars in, in a while? Uh, so this uh, makes us wonder whether uh, how early star formation started and how efficient was star formation in the, in the, at the very beginning. Uh, another um, uh, um, another interesting tile of the puzzle is that uh, we don't only observe supermassive black holes in the early universe as uh, which are dominating the, uh, uh, the, the the host galaxy, but also we have indication that these supermassive black holes that uh, are we think are uh, uh, the uh, physical process that are. The, the 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 physical are uh, the origin at uh, the origin of the physical mechanism for regulating the star formation at the massive end uh, are also found in uh, relatively uh, uh, um, normal galaxies. So in normal star forming galaxies, have signature of uh, a, um, supermassive black hole or AGN uh, um, uh, contribution. Uh, so if we want to uh, study the, uh, the, the, the most massive galaxies, uh, so the, 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 sorry, the, the, the distribution of the most massive galaxies uh, tells us that if we look at the, this distribution, we, we see that the, the most massive galaxies are quite rare systems. So if we want to have significantly large samples of massive galaxies to be studied in the early universe, we have to look at uh, 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 at a quite large area in the sky. Mm. So here I'm showing you the, um, over in the background, you can see the large scale structure from the dark matter at ratio six from one of the, from the simulation that I show you at the beginning. And over, over, over imposed to this, we have the total area from all the, all the best HST uh, data that we have that was for instance, used to study uh, the star formation efficiency in the first billion year that I showed you before. And this is in, G, in, in yellow here. Uh, you can see what would be the ideal or, or, or the, at least uh, the order uh, of magnitude of the ideal uh, area for to, in order to study the most massive galaxy. You can see here, you can have an idea of, the, of how uh, important it is to have very large area by just looking at the uh, um, um, uh, lighter um, spots here. There are very few here. If, if we place our aperture, our survey only in this region here, we may, may, may end up missing uh, uh, counts of galaxies. So in order to uh, study the most massive galaxies, people have, have started to, uh, has, has been looking at very wide areas, both from HST, as I said, you, but HST is still limited in, in area, and especially from ground. From ground, we can have uh, um, areas of the order of the square degrees. Um, uh, and uh, here, I would just like to briefly introduce a, a new program, which is called Rebels. Uh, so we have been uh, um, searching for the most massive galaxies in the first, uh, um, uh, um, let me think, it's about uh, uh, 700 million years after, after the Big Bang, around 700 million years. Uh, and uh, um, we have searched about seven square degrees of sky, which is a relatively large area. For this, it's the largest area available for this kind of study. And we have found uh, 40 uh, very massive galaxies um, with redshift between six and eight. So uh, approximately 700 billion years after the Big Bang. And uh, these galaxies are going to, are being observed with ALMA uh, in order to 
confirm the redshift uh, because so far these are only uh, selected photometrically and also to study um, uh, the, the, the content in gas and, uh, and dust. Uh, this is still preliminary. But the uh, good news uh, is that we have been able, we, we are able to obtain uh, data uh, uh, through JWST, so spectra for 12 of these galaxies. And these uh, spectra are going to give us a, quite a, a, a broad range of information uh, on, the, on their physical state that you can see here, uh, a quick summary of this, of this kind of information. Uh, and uh, one of these, uh, or at least two of these uh, uh, kind of information are, for instance, the age of the stellar population. And also uh, we are all, uh, hopefully we are able to, uh, to construct a resolved, uh, uh, radial profile of the specific star formation rate, so of the age of the stellar population. So we are going to recover the age of the stellar population as a function of the distance from the center of the galaxies. And so hopefully we are going to be able to place uh, uh, points, new points on the uh, star formation efficiency plot uh, at, uh, in the early universe. So I leave here my conclusion and uh, I'll take uh, questions. Thank you, Mauro. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Um, are there any questions? So those who do not have any microphones, so if you want to write down your questions in the chat, then I'll read them loud. And if not, you can also just uh, raise your hand on, or directly start speaking. Luis Colina, do you have a, any question? Yeah, muted his. Ah, uh, okay. Well, yeah. So, I don't know. You are muted your microphone. Uh, so I thought you may you may have a question. No, 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 no. no. I'm uh, I'm fine. Can you yeah, hear me? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's Do fine. you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, I have uh, I have problems with the connections. Well, uh, Stefano, uh, thank you very much for the very interesting the uh, uh, talk and uh, just presenting the the latest. Uh, uh, results. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, with the new uh, IRAC images, you detected uh, quite a large number of uh, galaxies that achieve around uh, eight, and uh, apparently all of them with a very high equivalent widths. Uh, I'm looking very quickly to the plots you were presenting, right? So probably meaning that the uh, uh, the, the conversion to a stellar well, star formation rates uh, are probably very, very, very high as well. So would, uh, this is one uh, first question is, would you expect uh, to be all galaxies with a, a similar star formation rate that I think uh, will be above uh, one solar masses per year or even 10 solar masses per year? Or this is just the very tip of the iceberg. And then the, thing, the, the second question relates to the, uh, the estimates of the stellar mass, because uh, this is the, the other thing that you mentioned there, the, uh, uh, the stellar mass uh, function at those uh, very high redshifts. Uh, I, presumably this is done with the standard estimates through SEDs and the standard IMFs and so on. So to what extent you are able to constrain the low mass n of the IMF and therefore to really estimate uh, the total mass on, on stars, uh, in particular if they are not very young. So if they are like uh, 40 or 50 million years old uh, for these galaxies. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good points. Both, both points are very good. So the first question is, if I understand, Correctly, um, uh, if there are so uh, from the from these strong emission lines, we infer very high star formation rates. And you are wondering, so this uh, the plus the, the the SEDs that I'm showing here, I didn't say in, in, in the talk, but are average are stacking of uh, about uh, twenty five or thirty objects in each bin of, uh, and uh, we actually have a a quite 
uh, range in, in colors mm, uh, uh, from individual sources. And uh, actually the error bars here, I would say, uh, include this, this uh, scatter in colors. And uh, there are indeed some sources which have, uh, uh, for which both colors, both IRA color are red, which are suggesting uh, uh, more evolved stellar population and have uh, uh, a uh, UV uh, luminosity, which is similar to the UV, to the, uh, UV luminosity of, 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 uh, of sources which have strong emission lines. So there are uh, probably uh, uh, sources which uh, uh, um, uh, more evolved sterile population, which are also still, uh, um, which have a, a UV luminosity similar. So the star formation from UV, uh, which is similar to, to the other sources. Uh, one thing that I didn't show is that uh, uh, if we uh, compare the, so if we, uh, it's a bit a, a long shot actually, but, but this is something that I tried in the paper, but uh, we can compare the star formation rate that we can sort of reconstruct from the, this emission line. So the, the, uh, the emission lines involved here are H beta and O3, but we, of course we get H beta plus O3 to, altogether. And compare this to the uh, star formation rate that we have from, uh, from the UV. And uh, if we try to compare these two star formation rates, we see that uh, uh, the star formation rate that we have from O3 and H beta is higher than the star formation rate from the UV. So this may suggest that uh, because the emission lines uh, uh, probe a shorter time scale in star formation than the rest UV, so like H alpha is five, 10 million years, if I'm not wrong, and uh, rest UV is of the order of uh, 100 million years. So this probably suggests that there is either an increase or, uh, in, in, in the star formation rate for the star formation. So the star formation history is increasing, right? With time, um, and uh, uh, the the second question was about uh, sorry, stellar mass. Uh, stellar uh, mass. Yeah. Um, uh, we are not able right. to constrain the the IMF for for these sources. So we I'm just using standard recipes. So for for this, I was using Salpeter uh, between uh, what is it uh, 0 0.1 and 100 solar masses, which. Uh, uh, sort of best that we can do right now. Uh, maybe with uh, um, so we, we, with we, with the rebels, uh, we are going to have uh, um, emission lines, and uh, one possibility would be to uh, recover the dynamical masses for those galaxies, and then from the dynamical masses, maybe we one can comparing uh, to we, one can maybe reconstruct the the IMF. But in general, for these samples, uh, it's it's a uh, it's already very challenging to obtain, let's say, standard uh, results, and uh, we don't have enough uh, points to uh, uh, to constrain the IMF. So, yeah, I, I agree that it's a it's a very good yeah, point. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think Pablo thank has you. another question. Uh, yes. Hello, Mauro. Hi. Nice to hear from you. Nice, nice talk. Uh, hopefully, we will know about the Atracción de Talento program soon. Yeah. And we can try to bring you here. So uh, I have a, a question related to the to the to one of the main results that you presented. You mentioned several times that the star formation efficiency of the universe does not seem to change after very high redshift, uh, yeah. uh, after redshift 8, 9, even in your in your work. And I think you only, a related thing is that the stellar mass density follow dark matter density. That's another thing that you, yeah, in that, in that plot. So there are three related points that uh, I would be happy to hear your opinion about because this directly translate to no effect of radiative cooling of the baryons at, no, at all red shifts. And that could be a bit strange uh, because I would expect that to, to change with metallicity. Another point, interesting point about this is that, well, even your own work, you work a lot with massive galaxies 
And we know that they appear in large numbers in, the, in early times in the universe, even more than what the models say. And many of these massive galaxies are quiescent. The models normally don't like that. So how can you reconcile that there is no uh, uh, evolution of the star formation efficiency, but we see those massive galaxies uh, in excess of what normally the, the model says? Uh, there were two other related points. One was the IMF, and you already said something about that. And, and well, the, the, the basic, the, the, probably the most important question would be, if the star formation efficiency does not change, what rules the rise of the star formation rate density from very high redshift to redshift of two-ish or so? Yeah. Um, I will start from the massive, uh, from, from the massive galaxy. So for, uh, I think uh, our results are, are, are not inconsistent with the existence of very massive galaxies just because or at least the main point is that uh, I'm not probing here uh, massive galaxies enough to be able to say anything about the star formation efficiency for those massive galaxies. Like GNZ11 uh, is, so uh, GNZ11 is a, a galaxy, it's the highest redshift galaxy that we know right now, spectroscopically confirmed, and uh, it has a, a UV luminosity, uh, it is, uh, 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 very high, and uh, if we convert, sort of convert this UV luminosity into mass, we get, as Pablo was, was saying, we get very high mass. Uh, but this, th that mass here is not very well constrained in our, that mass regime is not very well constrained, probed by our uh, 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 work. So, uh, I, I think I, I, uh, it is reasonable to say that uh, um, I, I can leave this open. I mean, I agree. Maybe uh, the star formation efficiency uh, for very massive sources uh, evolved, hmm? uh, or at least was was, was different for uh, at, at very early times uh, was different from those of uh, lower mass galaxies. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be an interesting uh, an interesting. Uh, uh, topic to, to study, I think, uh, uh, also with, with Rebels data and JWST data. So we are probing. So I think the, ma the, the, the master regime that you are referring to is this one here. Uh, and uh, and uh, I would think I, 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 it would also be a, uh, quite exciting, exciting to, to find uh, uh, a, 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 an evolving uh, star formation efficiency at the very massive end rightly because of what you're saying. So we, we observe this like a uh, uh, red and very massive galaxies, which have already stopped forming star at, uh, uh, at uh, later uh, time, cosmic times, right? Redshift four or, or so, uh, which all point to this uh, uh, um, uh, uh, evolution of the star formation efficiency. But right now, I, as I can say, uh, I would like to, uh, to, to say that I'm, I'm, I'm not able to constrain that, right? And then, uh, let me see, the, um, the, the evolution of the, yeah, of, of metallicity and, uh, yeah, that's a, uh, that's a good point. Um, uh, on the other side, um, let me think. So I think, uh, well, it, yeah. Um, so you expect, an, uh, of course, a, a, an evolution in metallicity, uh, but we, again, in the, also in this, so this regime of, uh, of redshift is, uh, 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 is sort of frontier, so we don't have uh, uh, very good information of a lot of physical parameters. And even if we expect, uh, for instance, metallicity to evolve, we don't have uh, um, um, uh, estimates of metallicity. So, uh, I, yeah, I really, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what um, what the best answer would be uh, for for that. Um, yeah, um, maybe you can discuss offline. Maybe that's something to, <laughs> to think <about laughs> for future. For future. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, but I think I also missed another. Uh, sorry, I was not taking note of the question. I, I, I forgot the, the third question. That, that's okay, Mauro. That's okay. We're going to discuss online. Right. And I think Bruno uh, Rodriguez has another question. Uh, hi, Mauro. I'm Bruno. So uh, I had a question about the, the, the stellar mass function that you showed. There are different redshifts. So you showed that at uh, redshift 9 and 10, uh, when you, you said that it was uh, quite uncertain. But at Resip 9, there is like a significant discrepancy with, uh, with other works. So what will be the reason? Uh, for that yeah, um, so um, the, the right shift of all these, of all galaxy of 99% well, of galaxies in this sample, uh, or 99.9, .9, uh, is, uh, of, uh, is uh, photometric. So we just uh, fit models Mm -hmm. uh, to the photometry, and from uh, this fit, we recover the redshift. Redshift nine is um, uh, it's a very difficult uh, redshift for for I realized it was a very difficult redshift uh, for the study of for the measurement of stellar masses. Uh, the problem is that um, let me see if uh, I don't remember. Uh, yes. So uh, here, okay. It happens that uh, in this redshift uh, window, uh, is 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 uh, the uh, flux density in the in the four point five micron uh, IRAC band is very sensitive to the presence of the uh, of the strong emission lines, which means that. Uh, the uncertainty in the measurements of the photometric redshifts uh, is introducing a large certain uncertainty in in the in the in what the flux density that we measure is registering right if it is registering emission lines or if it is not mm -hmm. and so <clears throat> uh, i uh, in order to measure the stellar masses of these sources, I did not directly use uh, the flux density in the IRAC bands, but I used uh, some interpolation between flux density at redshift 10 and redshift 8, because I wanted to get rid of that problem. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> but I also, uh, um, so I don't want to say that my measurements are uh, for sure better than other people measurements uh, because I'm sure that there are uh, many other kind kind of uns of uncertainties like uh, uh, also like a cosmic variance. So the measurements in 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 our uh, in our work are, are are based on samples identified in fields which are different from, for instance, uh, these other other works here. And so uh, if we um, uh, if we sorry, uh, if we take uh, if we use a too small uh, um, uh, too small uh, <clears throat> uh, area, if we uh, um, uh, if we sorry search for sample in too small area, we may end up either uh, including too many bright sources or too few bright sources, or uh, uh, and this effect then. Uh, um, is modulated by the luminosity of the sources. So uh, there could also be this kind of effect. So samples do not directly compare one to each other. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I would say these two are, are the main responsible for, for potential, for, for this observed systematics. Hmm. And uh, redshift 10 is uncertain uh, because uh, the sample is very small. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, six sources in total, something like that. Yes. Uh, and uh, are very faint. So uh, even for, uh, for, for the, in the IRAC detection, the signal to noise is not uh, super significant. And, and, and so it is difficult to uh, correctly estimate the, the stellar masses. Okay, because in the, in the next slide, I think, no, you, you see that aggressive nine and ten. You see that that point deviates, right? So I was wondering whether that deviation. This this one here, you mean? 
No. So the, the points at Resident 9 and uh, 10, no, they seem to deviate from the purple. Oh, um, the red, oh okay. The orange, no? Or from this, from this. But so this is just a, um, um, a, a linear fit uh, to these points here. And so <clears throat> the idea here was just to show that this point here deviate from the extrapolation of this trend here that we observe at lower redshift. Okay. 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 It's not a comparison to the to another measurement. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So I think there are no other questions. So thank you very much, Mauro, for joining us today. Thanks uh, to you. And then uh, let's see what happens with the Atracio de Talento. Good yeah. luck. <laughs> Thanks. Okay.